Hello and welcome to Paleocast. This is the second part in a two-part birthday special. It's a happy 175th birthday to the Paleontographical Society, or PALSOC, the world's oldest society dedicated to paleontology. Now, if you missed the first part of this Geburtstag Bonanza, you can either check it out first or listen afterwards. But I highly recommend listening to both because they really complement one another and talk about slightly different things. Now, my guest in this episode is Dr. Caroline Butler from National Museum of Wales. Caroline is the first woman president of PALSOC, so in other words, it took over 170 years for there to be a female president. We reflect on why that might be and the role of women in learned societies, past and present. Caroline tells me more about what PALSOC does, and we discuss the place of scientific monographs in modern scientific practice. Are they still relevant? She also tells me how this historic organisation is adapting to meet the needs of the paleontological community in the 21st century. So, let's meet Caroline and start talking more about PALSOG. So Caroline, uh, welcome to PaleoCast. Hello. Um, before we begin, uh, could you introduce to our listeners um, just a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, hi, I'm Caroline Butler, and I'm the president of the Paleontographical Society. Um, my day job is at Amgether Cymru National Museum, Wales, where I'm head of paleontology. Uh, I'm a paleontologist, and my research area is Paleozoic bryozoans. These are small colonial marine animals, uh, which I work on usually there, there calcified colonies and I work on the taxonomy and ecology of them. Okay, so as you say, today we're going to be talking about uh, the Paleontographical Society. So um, I guess we should start off with, um, uh, well, one, one of the themes, one of the reasons we're talking actually is because it's the 175th anniversary of the Paleontographical Society being founded which makes it, of course, one of the oldest um, dedicated paleontological societies in the world, which is kind of amazing. But I guess the flip side of that is to ask if it's really so old, is it mouldy? Is it still relevant? Uh, should there be a pal sock? I think you're the the person to ask. <laughs> um, it, it is old, as you say, it's one of the oldest paleontological societies, uh, but I think it still is relevant. Um, we have a slightly strange remit. Our, our remit main purpose is to publish monographs. And a monograph is um, a publication which illustrates and describes fossils. Now, the Paleontographical Society has a remit where we describe British fossils. So it's, it's quite geographically constrained. And the so we illustrate, we gone back in time when originally the illustrations were drawn and now they're you know, photographs, but we illustrate and describe a particular group of fossils either from a geographical area within the, the British Isles or a particular ge geological period as well. Uh, but we don't just upon a, uh, publish monographs. That's our main purpose. But we also do other things. We give out awards. Um, we give out awards to early career researchers in taxonomy. Uh, we also give awards to assist paleontological research. And we're hoping to set up an award to actually um, to part fund undergraduate work as well, to, to broaden our remit as well. So it sounds really like PALSOC do an awful lot of different things. I mean, you've, you've touched on lots of them there, but I'd like to go back to what you said about monographs. I think, I mean, for some of our listeners, uh, they're going to know exactly what a monograph is, but I think nowadays monographs are not really so common, are they? What, what you, you touched on it already, but what is the difference really between publishing something as a monograph versus a publication in another scientific journal? A lot of the publications in scientific journals, you have a, an almost a research question which you set out to answer and you answer that within within the paper in a scientific journal. A monograph is very much descriptive. You have a group of fossils and you describe them, you describe the taxonomy of them and you illustrate them. So in a way, you don't perhaps have that research question. But mm. monographs are really important because they, they form the foundation for other taxonomic research. Mm. And perhaps they have their papers, their issues that have real longevity. People describing, um, if I'm describing 
fossils today, then I'll look back at monographs that are hundreds of years old to look at how they were first described. So they, they have a real importance and the illustrations are particularly important because when you're trying to do taxonomy today, you want to look back at what the original holotype and the original species looked like and these monographs provide it. So whereas they perhaps don't have the impact factor, they have longevity and they are a really important research for all kinds of other t- um, paleontological research. Mm, that's that is interesting because I hadn't really thought about the longevity thing. I guess when I think about it, I quite often look up incredibly old papers to actually just look at the anatomy because even if our knowledge about the kind of other questions that we might ask about these animals changes, the anatomy doesn't. Um, you know, even if the species might get updated, you can still look back and, and read in a, a, a good monograph about that creature and it's still actually it's relevant, isn't it? It really matters. It's really useful. It is. And, that, and one thing about the monographs is the illustrations are good. I mean, some of the old illustrations are beautiful. Some of the hand-drawn ones are mm-hmm. lovely. But if when you compare them to the actual specimen, they're, they're excellent illustrations. And it's it's useful now, although you know, in the digital age, we have um, a lot of imi- uh, lots of museum specimens are now digitized, but an awful lot still aren't. Mm-hmm. And monographs provide that original description as well of the of different species. Yeah. So you also talked about different things that PALSOC um, basically sponsors. So you mentioned things like, were you, am I right in thinking you were involved with um, sponsoring the excavation of the Rutland ichthyosaur that came out not that long ago? We were. We uh, we gave money towards that. People, um, we, we do offer money out uh, for different causes. Uh, another thing we uh, also provided money for was the Mary Anning statue, oh, um, which yeah. we very much wanted to support to to support to women in science as well, and the just the um, the visualization of women in science and the, the role models. We we also give money for conferences as well. Um, conferences are getting more and more expensive to organise, um, and we'll often give money to to specialist conferences that uh, are looking at um, often the the paleontology and taxonomy uh, within that conference so we will get help give money to help these mm. the um, maquette of um, the Mary Anning statue was just at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History where I am and it was absolutely beautiful and it, it's quite touching to think that even in a small way that you're kind of part of that a really significant new statue, the creation of something to commemorate somebody who really is one of the, really becoming one of the most famous names, I think, in paleontology, isn't she? I, I think definitely. I was actually, I was lucky enough to go to the uh, unveiling of the statue down in Lyme Regis. Oh, and it, it's, wow. it's a beautiful statue. It's uh, just the the detail on it. Um, it's, it shows her dog with her and her dog has little ammonites even in his ears. Oh. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just a lovely statue. And I think, I think, Originally, when you, I knew very little about Mary Anning when I was a student. I, you, I knew she collected collected fossils, but I hadn't realised just how much knowledge she had. She wasn't just a collector. She she actually you was a scientist. She had enthusiasm for science and enthusiasm for discovery as well. So she wasn't just you know just commercially looking at fossils. And it's good that you bring up um, women and their role in science because another reason I wanted to speak to you is because you are in fact the first female president of PALSOC, aren't you? I am, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, and congratulations, that's uh, really amazing. But um, I, w- <laughs> I wonder if you have um, any comment on why you think it took 175 years for the first female president to be elected. Um, it's, I mean, in a way, it is appalling that it's taken this long. <laughs> it really is. Um, I mean, I looked at. Um, I mean, I know you've actually written a, a paper on the role of women within the Paleontological Society, and we've had authors from you know at least a hundred years ago. But the first, you know, the first um, council members came in quite early in the early twentieth century. But we didn't have. Uh, women in the major roles until the latter part of the 20th century. And I really don't know why it's taken so long. Um, I can think of so many women who, you know, before me who would have been very, very worthy of being the, the you know, the president of the society and, and should have been president of the society. So um, I hopefully I, I'll be the first of many now. <laughs> yeah, I certainly hope so. Um, yeah, it's certainly looking at the really early history, there, it's, it's interesting because we've got two sides of the coin. On the one hand, there were no, as you say, there were no women playing any of the significant sort of major roles that you, well, the outward facing roles, I guess, is what we're really talking about. And yet there were 
uh, lots of women members who were just ordinary members right at the very, very beginning, including um, Elizabeth Philpott, um, speaking of Mary Anning, yes. <laughs> of Lyme Regis, um, but also lots of illustrators and then late, the collectors as well of fossil material and a lot of their material being published on by PALSOC. But as you say, it just seems like there's this huge lag um, from women being able to get involved and in being active council members. And, and I think the first female VP wasn't until 2015 or something yes. like that. So, yes. so, but, but, you know, better late than never. <laughs> I, I think, I think we now have momentum. Um, and hopefully you, I mean, now we're starting to get parity within the, um, within the council that you're actually getting your know, male and female, um, equally divided. And, and I think that started I me. Mean, I know you're in, in different councils. I mean, I look at I look at now and I look at a conference and if all the keynote speakers are male, I wonder why. Yeah. And, and I think people are starting to notice this. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, and I must admit, if I'm, I'm an editor of a journal, if I'm sending papers out to review, then I, I try to, to mix things up and get your know, younger women to actually start being able, able to edit, um, to review papers. Yeah. Yeah, I look forward to a time where we don't have to consciously think about it because we do just automatically have this, you know, the parity. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm great. actually in a department, you know, my, my department that I work in is actually has more women than men in it. And I'm often in meetings now in the museum, which are either all women or predominantly women. So it, it is changing. It's changing a huge amount from when I started. So um, going back uh to what we were talking about, what PALSOC does and, and what it has done in the past and what it's doing now. I wonder, as as the president now, of course, you are um, responsible for kind of driving the course. You you have your, your hand on the wheel, as it were. Um, I wondered where you, you plan on kind of taking PALSOC over the coming years. Um, is it it is obviously more of the same, but do you have any ideas about um, ways in which you think it needs to change perhaps for the future? Well, I think I mean, one thing we're changing is is the the um the con the, the composition of council. I think is is one thing that uh, it was starting to change. And I think you know, we're getting more women, but we also need more diversity. And I think um, women is only part of that. Um, you know, in science in general, we don't have people of colour, uh, mm. and we have to make sure that we get even more di diversity within it. So I think that's that's an important aspect. I think we also make, have to make sure that monographs still have a role. I think it's quite hard now to to publish a monograph. It, when you're an, an early career researcher, you're expected to publish in high impact factor journals mm. and a monograph isn't one of those. So we're going to have to look at the future of, you know, will monographs continue to have a role? I think they do, but it might be hard. We don't want to just rely on people who are retired who finish up and you know, end, end up spending their retirement writing their monographs. <laughs> yeah. um, so we have to think about what we would do if we started to to run out of monographs um, and run out of people who are writing monographs and what, what the next stage will be. I mean, it might not come in my time, but I want us to start being prepared and to have these conversations of, of how we will go forward. I mean, there are there are. Uh, things that we can think about, whether we want, instead of monographs, just long taxonomic papers, papers that can't, couldn't possibly be in a journal, but are a bit short for a monograph. Do we want to bundle up things like that? Mm. Or do we want to expand beyond the, the British Isles? That's another option for us. Well, if I, I mean, I could just, every single time that I'm looking at these really massive papers on, on my subject area, which is, is Mesozoic mammals, almost all of these big papers have a very little actual description in them. So I, I can really see why, you know, I, I would really hope that there would be a place for these these important descriptions that actually let you properly access the anatomy of an, anatomy of an animal, an outlet for them to be published. Um, I, I like your idea of perhaps assisting earlier career researchers to do that as well, because as you say, we are kind of pushed always to go for these big impact journals, but they might be big impacts according to their factors. But um, do they actually have the same longevity? I wonder if people can't people can't actually look at the anatomy because it's not in it. It's not in the paper. Exactly. You always you always need to go back to the specimens, and the monographs do provide your know, excellent descriptions of specimens, and I think that's that's their huge value. Um, and again, it's it's just this this longevity because I mean, when I do systematic work, a lot of the papers I'm looking at are really quite old, um, and they're, but they're still very relevant. And I think the thing about our monographs is that the the illustrations are excellent normally, mm. um, and that's that's the value of them. And I think I think we I also I'd like to just um, 
let people more people know about what we do um we have we're starting to get engaged more with social media and i know if we've started to try and put some of our monographs out on twitter because people a lot of people don't appreciate what what a huge resource there is mm. Definitely. Uh, yeah, and we have a, um, there's a lovely new website as well, I, I believe. There is. <laughs> so uh, for all our listeners, if you would like to find out more about Palsock, definitely have a look at the beautiful new website, which has got some of these gorgeous monographic um, figures we were just talking about in it. And check out the Twitter uh, as well. And the, I think the other thing I'd uh, we want to try and do is to, I think PALSOC was very London centric. We had all our meetings there, all our council meetings there. Mm. And I think the pandemic managed to, to, well, we actually, we sort of reviewed ourselves after the pandemic because we started to have virtual meetings, of course, because everyone did. Mm. And the first um, annual general meeting after the pandemic was actually in Oxford. It was the you know, one of the first times out of London. And we usually have an annual lecture. And this time we had two annual lectures so we had to, it was it was starting to get just just more people involved and we'd like if possible to perhaps not every year but every couple of years to move out of london to to make us more visible yeah it's really interesting again going back to the age of the society that you know for 175 years it really hasn't left london has it it hasn't no not at all. <laughs> yeah it's about time to dust off the shoes and uh, get get going around the country and start going to different places i think so i mean it means that you know, some of the people who are at london can't go to the annual meeting but it means other people can and i think you know, it, it should be you can't and one thing one thing we did manage to do is to have um a, a hybrid meeting as well which was great so it means that people who can't attend the annual general meeting can still um can still take part virtually and mm -hmm. i think that's important because it means that you know people abroad can take part in our annual general and it's also it, it gives ownership of the society to more people yeah, definitely. There's there's something to be said for the the kind of benefits of what's happened with lockdown is that you know, as you say, it's broken down these barriers and people are starting to be able to access things that unless you actually went to the event in the past, you just wouldn't be able to have anything to do with. So um, yeah, there are there's silver linings. Yes, and it's also it, it it means that the the membership can engage you know, people who have any childcare problems, any caring problems mean that they can then go to meetings, which they probably wouldn't have been able to before. So it it, it does make it just more available to people. So I guess um, the final thing I think from my point of view that I would highlight to our listeners is um, is I know you've again you've touched on this earlier but the grants that uh, Palsoc offers because that's actually how I first heard of the Paleontographical Society when I was a student was a, um, applying for the Richard Owen uh, Research Award which um, I got and it enabled me to do some of the first research that I was carrying out so um, I think for any of our listeners who want to carry out small projects of their own um, or something within their their PhDs or their masters or undergraduate studies definitely worth getting in touch with Palsoc isn't it Oh, definitely yes and and also we want to get more in pe more people involved in the council as well and so uh, before it was very much the sort of closed shop of who was who was going to be on council but we now advertise uh, the positions on council through our social media so if anyone sees positions advertised then you know please please apply for them we we're, we're welcome welcome anyone now so they can actually be part of changing this really like old established society updating it and changing it and taking it into the future um yeah, exciting. That's it. Well, Caroline, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you today. Um, thank you so much for joining me on Paleocast. That's lovely. Thanks very much. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone, with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat, and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So, if you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.